Uh, now, all over the world, government, uh, governments and industries and businesses and individuals are considering the impact of climate change uh, on their operations and how they can build a more sustainable future. From the paddock to training yards to race courses, the, su the sustainability of horse racing to, is wholly dependent on our environment. I'd like to invite Ruth Dancer, the director of White Griffin, for today's keynote on the impact of climate change on horse racing. Thank you very much, Ruth. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for having me here today. It's a huge pleasure to be covering a global topic in front of a global audience for a change. And before I continue, a big hat tip to Wota and the team for putting the environment on the agenda today. We're often not invited, having very miserable climate scientists coming along and spoiling your party. But I promise that whilst I will give you the truth today, I will try and do it in a motivating and positive way. And so in March of this year, I, uh, White Griffin conducted a report um, commissioned by the BHA and supported and financed by the Racing Foundation into the environmental sustainability risk challenges and opportunities of the British horse racing industry. We were supported by a steering group and after industry-wide questionnaires and, and uh, 50 hours of interviews, um, we produced a 120-page report, which you'll be delighted to know is safely secured in the archives of the VHA. And you just have a 20-page report, which is available online for everyone to use and take advantage of, which provides insights into environmental sustainability. This report was all about um, Britain, but with the support of Oita and coming here today, I have tried to extrapolate out the findings to have a truly global reach. Because fundamentally, whether you're in America or India, the challenges are broadly the same. And so today, I'm going to transform a lot of that report into what I hope will be useful and applicable to you all when you go back to your day jobs in your own countries. So let's start by breaking down what is an enormous topic. It's what happens in the whole world, effectively. So in order to be able to capture that, we have um, narrowed it down into six key topics. And I'm going to run through those with you today. So starting with fossil fuels and water availability, biodiversity and land use, waste, and although we said recycling, I, I prefer to say resources, commercial partnerships in the supply chain, and reputation management. We're going to have a whistle-stop tour through all of that, and then I'm looking forward to questions at the end. The first courtesy we owe to one another is the truth, and so let's start with the biggie, fossil fuels. This is what environmental sustainability really is all about, not plastic straws, cotton buds, reusable cups. They are a very small part of the story and an important one, but fossil fuels and greenhouse gas emissions is what we really need to be focusing on. We've seen for ourselves um, that post the Industrial Revolution, we've been putting inordinate amounts of fossil fuels into the air in, in the form of greenhouse gases. And at the same time, we've been removing the very thing that can suck out the damage through deforestation, ocean acidification, and all sorts of other um, mechanisms that have helped make our lives more comfortable, go faster, be easier. And that's great, but unfortunately, the consequences of that have been negative. So let's just take a moment to focus in on extreme weather, which is the consequence of fossil fuels. And we've seen for ourselves the rise in extreme weather all over the globe. In the UK, um, flood risks have increased to one in six properties being at risk of flooding. We've had the mildest new year on record in 2022. Europe has had the hottest summer on record. Reservoirs have run dry, and of course in Pakistan at the moment we're seeing that they're very tragically suffering a humanitarian crisis. I told you this speech wasn't going to be great fun, apologies. Even this morning in preparing myself for the talk, BBC News, the top ten headlines, um, was in Australia um, today. Tragically, they are suffering terrible floods. Um, in one county, I think it was Victoria's, um, receiving four times the average rainfall you'd normally get in October in 24 hours. It's happening right now, today. And we have to be absolutely clear about this in a global context, that climate change is going to make horse racing disappear in certain locations globally if we don't take the necessary steps, and whether that's due to sea level rising or floods, droughts, storms, whatever it might be. 
And I was at this Sport Positive Summit last week, which, if you don't know, is um, a summit that was held at Wembley Stadium for people from all over the globe, from sporting bodies, to talk about environmental sustainability. And on the stage, we had the CEOs um, um, of federations talking about the fact that they are having to change their calendar of events because host cities are literally flooding. They are not able to host those events there anymore. So this is something that we really need to wrap our heads around. And extreme weather is already here globally, and it's impacting the horse industry, whether that's heat waves, um, we, you know, we've got what happened in the UK, but also in Japan, in Australia, in America. We know that extreme weather events are already impacting on, on what's happening with racing. We're already seeing cancellations uh, happening. But it isn't just the ability of races to go ahead because of extreme weather. Thinking about what Rolo is saying, this is also about equine welfare. So we know that um, we have two challenges here. The first being the conditions of extreme weather on whether it is safe and appropriate for horses to race, whether the ground conditions are appropriate. But also, interestingly, um, the challenges of vectors um, traveling around the world that wouldn't have happened otherwise. And actually, in the US um, 2016 US Global Change Research Report, they said that climate change is likely to have both short and long-term effects on vector-borne disease transmission. And the first case of, uh, of this, um, so one example being West Nile virus, was diagnosed in Canada in 2002. But here in 2022, we've now got instances in Europe, in, in southwest Spain, Italy, Portugal, most recently in G Germany. So as I say, this isn't just about it being a little bit hot. This is about our biosecurity, how we're transporting our racehorses around the world. In the UK and Europe, we need to bear in mind the threat of legislative changes as well. So um, we know that transporting horses, we need to consider their, their welfare. And at the moment, there is a consideration for legislation to prevent transportation of all animals, but, but referencing equines as well, in temperatures warmer than 30 degrees. Now, of course, as we all love horses, we're all in complete agreement with that. But let's just bear in mind that in the UK this year, we had 40 degree temperatures. 30 degrees is not that strange anymore. And actually, the Met Office is saying that we are 10 times more likely in the UK to experience 40 degree temperatures. So actually, this legislative target is, is not ambitious, not out of reach. It's not, OK, well, when that happens, then we'll this is going to be very, very common. And so we need to wrap our heads logistically around how this will work. But what other considerations do we need to think about when it comes to greenhouse gases uh, and fossil fuels? One of the biggest ones that we need to think about is around net zero targets. Many countries around the world have come together under the UN um, Paris Climate Agreement and have agreed to set net zero targets. And the consequence of that is that um, we are required to report on our greenhouse gas emissions. So in the United States, most G20 uh, countries, in Australia, South Africa, there are already legislation in place that require certain um, companies to report on their greenhouse gas emissions. And that usually equates to their turnover or the number of staff um, that are within the organization. But we know that in order to reach those net zero targets, that that is going to have to come down into organizations like ours, like the, the smaller organizations, race courses, et cetera, that they will all be required to report as well. And we also know that we'll, we're going to be seeing um, price increases. Now, of course, the energy crisis, I'm certainly not going to pretend that that's due to climate change. Um, however, we do know that green energy tariffs will um, change uh, pricing. And actually in the UK, we've already seen that by means of um, ruling out red diesel, which has had a profound impact on um, businesses working in, in the racing industry. So given that there's a shift away, um, so given that fossil fuels are a key consideration, let's just have a look at how horse racing is impacted. And it's fairly obvious. So horse transportation, whether that be um, through air, by sea, or on land, 
human transportation through jockeys, valets, vets, as an example, jockeys, just jockeys, rack up over 40,000 miles a year. We've got 400 of those in this country. When you extrapolate that out across the world, that's a lot of mileage. And that's just the jockeys, that's not the valets and everyone coming to our events. So that's a huge footprint. The energy for our infrastructure and of course our machinery and our equipment, what we need for the land to make it work. And so we can be absolutely sure that there's two things we need to do. The first is to wean ourselves off fossil fuels in the long term. And that will be through green travel infrastructure, installing renewables and electrifying equipment. And I just want to be really clear, I come from an operational background. I worked in horse racing. I appreciate that one slide saying electrify your equipment seems terribly simple. In practice, of course, it's a challenge. We have to think about how we do it. We have to think about the money. But everything is in place for us to do this. All we need is the will. The second and most important thing we need to do is reduce consumption. Even if we transfer over and away from fossil fuels, we do not have the resources to continue to operate as we have. So we need to think about how do we reduce consumption while still doing what we want, hopefully to the same degree. Because I'm not in the business of stopping everyone from doing what they want to do. And so we need to be thinking about energy saving technology and also changing operations, thinking about practical ways in which we can reduce our energy consumption and still do what we're doing. Basic, basic things like switching off lights. Simple, simple things like that will have a huge impact. And so really what we want to do um, in this report is provide you with a series of recommendations that are practical, useful, can drive change. And although these recommendations were intended for British horse racing, they absolutely are appropriate and workable in a global context. And I think it's appropriate for us to think about the solutions in a global way, because the sport wants to conduct itself globally. Trainers, owners, they want to send their horses all over the place. And so in order to do that, in order to have this incredible industry that's vibrant in talent, probably worth having a global uh, view of things. A really interesting example is the much loved horse Red Caddo. Now, Red Caddo's uh, passport is certainly much more impressive than mine. I have to refer to my notes here because I'll forget in four years, this horse traveled from six runs in Australia, five in Hong Kong, three in Japan, two in Dubai, one each in France and Singapore. That's a lot of air miles. And again, I'm not in the business of suggesting we shouldn't be flying horses. Absolutely not. But I am in the business of thinking, how do we do that in the future in a way that is sustainable? And so a global strategy is appropriate and required. And so in order to do that, we need to think about introducing, measuring, and monitoring. We need to know what we do in order to discover how we can change it. And that's about reporting. Now, word of caution here, to do your carbon footprint is expensive. People would have to pay me and my colleagues lots of money, and we don't want to do that. We want to make it doable and accessible. So to support the industry, we've created an online tool that would enable any business to work out its carbon footprint without having to use someone like us. And we think that's a really powerful thing to do. Because if we're talking about global solutions, we need to think about solutions that are workable, that are affordable, that are practical, and that are meaningful. And the last element, carbon offsetting, generally considered the devil um, by sustainability consultants, but wrongly so, because as we transition from where we are now to where we want to be, there's a gap we have to bridge, and that gap is about um, carbon offsetting. And I think this is an area of interesting opportunity, because as the horse racing industry, we are landowners in abundance, and there is no reason at all why we can't use that land to generate um, carbon credits through appropriate means. And again, I've been working with a fantastic company that have the technology to understand the carbon potential of your land and through the work that you would then do to then convert that into appropriate and verifiable credits. And what that means is we're keeping money within the industry. We're not sending it off to some spurious carbon offsetting program that we're never going to know whether it's worked or not. So let's move now onto the next really fun topic, which is water availability. Now, this is a real passion topic for me, because when we do questionnaires, 
Time and time again, when we say, what are you most concerned about when it comes to environmental sustainability? This comes out around 40% or so, so I'm quite concerned about water availability. That's probably true in the UK, but I'm looking around the audience thinking there are people here from South Africa and other countries that have been living with the water crisis for a long time. And in the UK, my God, we don't know how lucky we are. So I'm very aware of my audience compared to, 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 to normal. And in fact, when I was doing research into this, whereas I would normally be saying the CEO of our water authorities is telling us in the next 20 years we're going to have chronic water shortages in the UK, we really need to address that. In 2004, Australia was saying this, and was saying we need to be thinking about our, our water use. And in 2007, the Victoria Racing Club was already addressing this by trying to reduce their consumption by 70%. Again, Canada, having a look at what's going on there, um, this has been one of the worst, most disastrous years um, for water-related extreme events. So around the world, you are very much more accustomed to water shortage being a significant issue. And I would urge those of you in the UK sat around to seek out your colleagues in those countries and understand what it really feels like to experience water shortage. And it isn't just concerns um, about the availability of water as well. We need to think about perception. And I think we've got some people from France in the room who will be aware of this, maybe others not so much. So this year, when we were all experiencing terrible, terrible um, droughts, uh, horse racing and golf and, and other groups were exempt. And people didn't take kindly to that. And so in France, they cemented the golf holes up in protest. Probably not popular with many people in this room. At best, it's slightly amusing, but at worst, we have to consider that at the moment, horse racing is getting a little bit of a pass because of the equine welfare um, angle, which is entirely appropriate, regarding water use. But I'm not sure how long we can rely on that when we know that people are being told not to use water for extended periods of time, and then they see us using it at great length for the purposes of our sport. So... The message on water is reduce, 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 and again, my colleagues around the globe will be absolute uh, taskmasters at this. It comes down to three key areas, looking at what our opportunities are in terms of boreholes and reservoirs, and uh, many of you, I think, are going to Ascot tomorrow. They are a fantastic example of the way in which you can become self-sufficient through the use of reservoirs. But also the second one on the list, which is water collection, using water from their roof in the, as grey water in their systems. They've taken a fantastic holistic approach and now they are self-sufficient. They're not worried about what's happening with water. That's where we all need to get to. And similarly, water-saving technology. So thinking about basic things like the taps in our washrooms, there is an abundance of technology out there that limits the water usage. And we should all be looking at, at how we can invest in installing that. So, recommendations. So, it's not a very responsive. <laughs> recommendations. So, again, thinking about Britain, but um, also across the world, we need to look at the ways in which we use water in our, our own businesses. And what I typically say to people in the room who say, well, what can I do when I go back to my own business? Identify how you use water in your business and think about the ways in which you might be able to do it differently. Very, very fundamental, simple process. We've, we've suggested looking at, um, across the board, the businesses that are at most risk. So in the UK, there are certain race courses, for example, Bath Race Course, that really suffer in, in, terms of, in terms of water use. And it's worth remembering that what affects one affects us all. So if we can identify the businesses that are most at risk and support them financially and through best practices, Maybe reaching across the border and saying, okay, hi, I'm from Australia, this is what we've done and it worked. Go ahead and do that in Britain. This is, this is, this is the process. Learn from us. So those are the two main topics. And if you remember nothing else from my talk, I'd really love you to remember fossil fuels and greenhouse and water usage. But we know that waste and resources are also part of the story. And actually, they're the most popular start part of the story for people to talk about. 
Um, we find typically when we interview people, they're around 85, 90, sometimes 98% of people consider it the most important consideration. And that's probably because of things like Blue Planet 2 series that I'm sure many of you in the room will have seen that have really shone a light on things like single-use plastics. In, in the world in general, waste is conducted or, or, or production of goods is conducted in what we'd call a linear model. So what we do is we, we take, we make, and then we waste. And that's absolutely great if you've got an infinite amount of places to put your rubbish and an infinite amount of resources to, to start building something new. But we don't have that. I mean, what we're actually doing is we're using resources at two and a half times the rate of what the world can cope with. And in turn, we're also choking our waterways and polluting our lands when we throw it away. I mean, in fact, methane from landfill emits 11% of greenhouse gases, uh, of, of methane um, from them. And within horse racing, we've got three key areas um, where we, uh, we produce waste. So first of all, from businesses, from our general waste, cardboard, food, that sort of thing, what we throw into the bin. We also have significant waste from significant items. So for example, our running rails, our padding that just gets skipped and dumped into landfill. And then finally, our horse marks. So it's something very specific to us and I suppose the agricultural industries. <laughs> we produce a lot of horse poo, a lot of muck, and that, there's a consequence to that. There's also a cost to that. Overwhelming majority of businesses have to pay to have that taken away. And it, interestingly, um, uh, a lady called Catherine Milne from uh, there we go from Sea Change Now, who produce a plastic-free biodegradable horse shampoo, said that she thinks the answer is to for the horse racing industry to take back traditional values, so valuing repairing and repurposing things like tack and kit, and the mentality of how we deal with our resources and our waste. So, go and really be the watchwords for what happens with in the horse racing industry in the future. Um, even, even in terms of thinking about what we do with the waste that we generate, so one of the projects that I've been looking at, um, such a glamorous lady, is how do we turn our horse poo into energy that, um, to replace our fossil fuel usage? To me, that seems like a wonderful circular story of taking waste and uh, repurposing its energy to wean ourselves off fossil fuels. And the technology is there, we're just not doing it yet. So again, um, what we're suggesting is take out the confusion of what to do with waste and centralise the approach. Copy what, what is already working with, with other people. Let's not spend years and years and years deciding whether a reusable cup scheme is better than a biodegradable one. We'll all fall over the cliff drinking out of a cup with our name on it. It's, it's a nonsense. So pick a solution that's working in the street and roll it out. Also think about centralising negotiations, and actually I was pleased to see a gentleman from the Hong Kong Jockey Club here. Um, you, the procurement process from the Hong Kong Jockey Club is really fantastic. There's no reason at all why we shouldn't be looking at that and, and using it in our other institutions. Thinking about the waste management hierarchy and the circular economy, so rather than take make waste, the circular economy keeps putting resources back in, and a great supplier you have within your industry is Giralock. They provide all of your white railing, and they have absolutely done that. Now, what's interesting is they did that in isolation from the horse racing industry because they reached out to the horse racing industry and said, we want to become more environmental. Can we talk to you about how we do that that works for you? And the horse racing industry said, no, we're not really interested. So that product has been produced in line with what hotels and football clubs want. Now, it's going to be fine, it's going to work for horse racing, but I think it's really important to make sure we're at the table. And then finally, think about phasing out single-use plastics, but also use resources that already exist out there, like wrap and let's recycle and kick plastic out of sport. It's all there. We just need to attune our minds to caring enough to get the information and apply it in our own lives. So. That is a real whistle-stop tour through sustainability, but I want to touch upon commercial partnerships in the supply chain. And um, normally this is a section where people think, well, that's all right, it doesn't really matter. Commercial is just a different thing. And I think that might be something you might want to say to British Cycling at the moment, um, and whether they feel that environmental sustainability impacts on their operations. Um, those of you in the room who may not know, British Cycling announced this week a seven-year deal with Shell. 
And needless to say, it's not gone down well. Why am I saying this? Because environmental sustainability does impact what we do commercially. Businesses are aligning themselves with brands that have got published environmental st strategies. It's impacting the way in which we perceive those brands. It's impacting the partnerships that we can secure. A positive example would be in the world of sailing, where 88% of their sponsorship deals now come because they have embraced in such a magnificent way the role that they have to play in, um, in the environment. And it's not just that. We know that because of net zero targets, people are ruling themselves out of being in the supply chain because if you're not on a net zero journey, you can't be part of theirs. It just doesn't, it just doesn't work. And it's not just commercial relationships we need to think about. The consumer, and we've heard a little bit about that already today, the consumer is so attuned to what is happening. And we've seen that a little bit with you know unpleasant photographs of cups and things left around after racing, that sort of thing. But make no mistake, that will absolutely transition into what we're doing with the land, what we're doing with our water, what we're doing with our fossil fuels. And also, if we want to be attracting the next generation of people to horse racing as horse owners or as staff or as visitors or as gamblers, we need to be aligning to what's important to them. And this is the most important topic to them. Thinking about it specific to gambling, which was an interesting sort of pivot for me mentally, um, anything that impacts horse racing impacts gambling. That's obvious to say. So I would like to think that all the information that I've given you so far, it's very clear that we need to act in order to safeguard the future of horse racing and therefore gambling. But also, thinking about um, the way in which particularly uh, extreme weather could impact gambling, is where trainers and owners are now withdrawing their horses from races due to um, whether it being unseasonably hot and they're afraid of horses that are not acclimatized, um, that they won't be able to cope, they don't like the hard ground. And so the potential that the field is getting smaller and weaker because of climate change would of course impact the gambling industry. So we suggest that you need to have a unified strategy about what you want to do. And then once you've done that, think about the partnerships that you want in place. Because when jockeys and, and race courses and race cards and all the other areas that are looking for sponsorship are out there seeking customers, seeking um, uh, companies to sponsor, they want to know what an appropriate alignment would be. And we need to provide them with that. And we need to help them with that so that they don't fall into a, a difficult situation that British Cycling is, is um, struggling with at the moment. And maybe the most important of the recommendations on the screen that I would love to see everyone in this room do, and that's be bold enough to be prepared to talk about it. Horse racing could be a real, real beacon for change in this area. I feel passionately about that but only if we're willing to talk about it. We're willing to talk about it amongst ourselves and talk about it to the media. Decide what we want to do and then tell them that we're doing it. It's also great for accountability because once you've said it, you kind of got to do it. But talking about it will help with staff retention. It will help with getting new visitors. It will help, of course, from an environmental point of view. So before I leave the stage, and I was absolutely sure that we would get the, uh, the fire bell during mine where someone just hits it because they've had enough of the climate, um, I wanted to end on a more positive note. She says that biodiversity is one of the biggest issues that we have to, to deal with, and the WWF have just released their annual report saying that we've now lost 70% of our biodiversity on the Earth. And again... Not a very positive thing to say, but we're really threatening our food security. And messages like global starvation have come out of the IPCC report, and we've just got to take them seriously. We can't turn away. We can't ignore it. It's a horrible message, but we've got to listen. But this is where horse racing can step up to the plate in the most powerful way. Horse racing is a sport of the land. We depend on the land for our race courses, our gallops, our paddocks, our feed, our bedding, and of course our catering. We are from the land, we are of the land, and as landowners, we have an incredible potential opportunity to demonstrate what stewardship really looks like. Um, and a study in Liverpool University has shown that this is already happening in a lot of areas, and, and certainly if you talk to breeders in particular, but breeders and trainers, they will tell you themselves that um, 
the horses on land can have a very positive role in biodiversity, but only when it's done properly and with expertise and with knowledge. And so what I would say is that look at things like the 2020 green assets of equines in the European context of ecological transition and agriculture report on your train ride on the way home, and have a look at the ways in which having equines on the land can have an incredible positive benefit on the environment. I'm talking about the growing of trees for, um, for your carbon insetting um, programs. I'm talking about the restoration of hedgerows, making space for nature. I'm talking about wildflowers. Horse comes first, but that doesn't mean that the rest of nature misses out. Horse first and over to nature after that. And if we can do this, as a, a collective, and I'm completely mortified that Rowley spoke just before me and I've picked a quote from him on the screen. Um, if we can do that as an industry, we are utterly changing the game. Rowley said, <laughs> and see if he remembers, collectively equines graze a huge amount of land which makes horse owners, knowingly or not, significant environmental stewards of our precious countryside, so small changes really can make a big difference. So although in report I've talked about pesticides and how we need to think about it and be aware, I want to focus here at the end of the talk on the positives. As massive landowners, we can demonstrate how things can be. And we, in doing so, because of the volume of the land, we can truly make a big difference. So again, let's take a collective approach globally. And when I say that, I appreciate that biodiversity in Africa means something very, very different to biodiversity in Europe. And so I'm not suggesting that we swap notes on how to help elephants versus how to help foxes. I mean, that would be absolutely ludicrous. But the concept of stewardship, the concept of taking our responsibility for the land seriously, we can share. So we can create centralized material to build knowledge. And think about how do we... Um, how do we work with new targets that are going to be established by COP15 and by all our national governments and benefit financially um, and reputationally from this opportunity too? I see the global horse racing industry as a pyramid of dependencies. We have different aspects of the industry represented here in yellow, racecourses, training yards, breeders, owners. And all the parts of the machine that get a horse from birth onto the race course and beyond. And above that, the people and the animals that, that make it happen. And of course, because I'm stood here with you all today, on top of that, the gambling, money, and, and everything that we do here today, which, which makes it happen. But that cannot be the total picture. Underpinning that pyramid is the environment. And if we don't address the concerns, the challenges, and the opportunities I've talked about today in terms of energy and fuel, water, biodiversity, and resources, the whole thing comes tumbling down. We have to put environment at the top of the agenda in our boardrooms, in our strategies, in our planning, and in our filter for when we're thinking about new innovations. This is the moment now for horse racing to come together and answer the toughest subject that there is. Do not underestimate the power of the jobs and the roles that you have in making a real change. And think to yourself on the way home, how do we change what we do to protect what we all love? Thank you. <laughs>